what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of inspiredinsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders you've heard of, some you've never heard of. And, you know, I've had uh, the founder of P90X, Tony Horton, was on. And, you know, he's made hundreds of millions of dollars or produced that amount of revenue in P90X. But Nick, I love hearing about the challenge stories, the tough points, the low moments. And he talked about how when he was driving cross country, he would put his hat on the street. Um, when he got to his destination, he had to make food and rent money, and he was a street mime. That's how he mm-hmm. actually made money. And uh, Julie Clark, founder of Baby Einstein, grew her company uh, to $20 million with five employees and sold to Disney. But I loved her talking about how she beat cancer twice and how she had to overcome a lot of um, you know, hardship and challenges with that. And um, Noam Bushnell, founder of Atari, talked about, you know, he was Steve Jobs' mentor, and Steve Jobs offered him 33% of Apple for $50,000. Oh. And why he said no at the time. <laughs> Crazy stories. That and many more, you can go to inspiredinsider.com and check it out. Um, it's amazing stories there. And um, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And we help B2B businesses connect to their Dream 100 clients and referral partners. And we do that by helping them launch and run their podcast. So it actually generates ROI. Um, it's been the best thing I've done for my business and my life because I get to connect with great people and feature their thought leadership. Um, And for me, it's a lot more personal than just business. Um, It was actually, you know, besides going to people's weddings and actually going on family vacations with people, um, (laughs) my grandfather was a Holocaust survivor and his brother and him were the only people out of their family to survive the concentration camps in Nazi Germany. And um, the words and legacy live on, like what does that have to do with podcasting? Well, the Holocaust Foundation did an interview with him and he's not alive anymore, but that interview lives on. It's a legacy right. for him. And if you go on the about page on Inspired Insider, you can watch the full video. I mean, it's graphic, so I just be aware of that uh, graphic detail. But I consider it leaving a legacy for mm-hmm. my guests and for myself. So Excellent. if you people have questions, you know, I think every business should have a podcast, just like Nick thinks every CFO, CHRO should join his network because it's probably the best thing they could do. And I think, you know, being around peers and sharing thoughts and collaborating is the number one thing that helps me in my business and life in general. So um, go to rise25.com. If you have questions, go to support at rise25media.com. Happy to answer any of your questions. And I'm going to introduce today's guest. Um, A shout out to Chris Snyder, founder of Jewel.com. Uh, and banks.com and the Snyder Show on podcast, we were talking and I'm like, what moves a needle like in businesses? What really <laughs> helps? And he's like, CFOs, like CFOs mm. are running financials. They are kind of making sure the direction financially, they're financially sound. And I'm like, I cannot believe I've not had anyone who's expert CFO or who has a network of CFOs. I look up the top, um, you know, search and your profile and person who's an expert, Nick, Nick Rocco. <laughs> and, you know, watch his interview on Bloomberg and you'll see what I'm talking about. It was, it was unbelievable how he navigates and how much expertise he has. So I'll formally introduce Nick Rocco as a co-founder and CEO of Achieve Next. You can go to AchieveNext.com or AchieveNextNetworks.com. But he helps run the CFO Alliance and the CHRO Alliance. And they basically... Um, and Nick is going to explain more, but they help basically introduce disruptive knowledge sharing to the C-suite, to the finance and HR communities in North America. And he's done it for the past 20 plus years and yeah. basically helping make connections. And he serves as a voice of these communities, representing over 10,000 finance leaders and members. He's been, you know, he's appeared on Bloomberg and many others. Um, so check out his site, AchieveNext.com and AchieveNextNetworks.com. Nick, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Jeremy. It's you a told me to keep to that as short as possible, yeah. but like <laughs> with your experience, I, I just want to go longer. 
So well, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. It's a pleasure to connect with you and more importantly, uh, to be provided the opportunity for us to have a chat. And we're going to talk about a lot of things and, and we will get into what Achieve Next is and some of the things that people should find out about it. But we were talking right before we hit record about difficult decisions. Like mm-hmm. right now, whenever you're listening to this, I mean, if you're a CFO, you're probably like, <laughs> I was born for this time. Like I have ice in my veins. I have to make difficult decisions all the time. But right now there's, you know, a pandemic, a crisis, and there's always a crisis going on. Mm-hmm. Not maybe as, as big as this one. So I don't know if you could share some of maybe the difficult decisions you have seen some of your members have had to make and, and maybe you've had to make in this time and how you're, you're the leader of this community, so you're probably helping people navigate this. Yeah, what a, what a great question and, and how timely indeed. But at the same time, core to the DNA of the culture that we've created and the focus for bringing finance leaders together. What's driving your decision making? Or can I bounce off of you? What's driving my basis for decision making is, is probably talked about 24 seven, both digitally, uh, virtually, and when we get back to it, face to face in some way, shape or form. So excellent question to start. You know, I, I, I will tell you, I, I feel like when we set off on this journey, And still to this day, there are people who think that the individual who wears the title of chief financial officer is not social by nature, not people driven, uh, is mired in the numbers, wears a green eye shade as as the accountants once did at one (laughs) point in time, worked worked behind a closed door, um, and uh, were the great kind of behind the cloak behind the curtain type of person. And that's just not the case in this day and age. You're, uh, Eliminate these stereotypes. I love it. Yes. Yeah. And your reference to what moves the needle or who helps move the needle. I love that being the conduit for us to talk about this and for us to connect because uh, the evolution of, of us all, uh, let alone the finance leaders, to uh, understanding what role we need to play and how easy it is for us to communicate in this day and age, given changes in technology and culture, our connectedness, but also the challenges and opportunities that come with that. I will tell you a major driver for that evolution of the CFO role and CFO decision making is that we as finance leaders, and I'm one of those, have never shied away from the idea and the natural desire to under, understand basis for decision making. That term basis began as a quantifiable kind of uh, numbers driven piece. Basis can also be a qualifiable, what I see and hear in the environment around me. But our natural willingness and ability to explain and understand and communicate a basis for decision making. I had my first real time understanding of that back in 2008 when we had our last go round of challenge and crisis and finance leaders were saying you know i just need to understand how we got there and how we can position ourselves for response and i said no you don't just need to understand you need to communicate it Mm. and understand how to communicate it and that's what's led to this sense of connectivity and purpose that that i've become all about and hopefully is the reason why that ceo said you know what moves the needle finance leaders so what, what have you heard um, through your network? What are some, dis- you know, you don't have to name companies or people, yeah. but some tough decisions people have had to make right now. So I will tell you, tough is, is an understatement. Yeah. Um, we're impacting and finance leaders who have a voice and a responsibility to make decisions during crises like these uh, are making decisions around their employees, you know, related to um, headcount, uh, related to, um, who is essential and quote non-essential to the business during the crisis and potentially around rebound. Um, they have to make decisions around um, and communicate decisions, not just on the employee side, but the client or customer side as well. You know, analyzing and communicating on not just um, who we can pay, will pay, and need to work within our own supply chain of delivery, mm-hmm. but can pay, will pay, and who be paid by on the client side. Yeah. You know, these, these numbers have people behind them. 
And so, you know, um, half the time we're talking about decisions that need to be made, made around the workforce. And the other half we're around the customer or client. And what we're trying to do is help finance leaders align those two and understand that one impacts the other. Yeah, it's really tough because if you have a vendor for a long period of time and you don't want to tarnish that relationship, but it, mm -hmm. at this point there may be something that's more pressing, what are some of the ways people are navigating that conversation? Is there like a good way of approaching that person? Or what, yeah. what do you... Yeah, I will tell you, I thank God that we began this journey to enable finance leaders to have a more confident, competent voice on decisions that need to be made and increase their visibility as an enterprise leader and a market leader and an industry leader, not just tucked away. I'm glad we began, began that journey years ago because at the core foundation for all of this is their willingness and ability to have a conversation. So first, they're no longer the CF knows. We used to call them that, right? Uh-oh, <laughs> here comes the CF no. Right? Um, They'll just stamp like, not right, approval so, on it or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, or here they come. They're going to say, no, we don't have the budget. No, <laughs> we don't see the pathway. So, uh, you know, over a dozen years ago, we began this journey to help free them up so they're not the CFO. But your question is a valid one. How do you, how are they having those conversations and how, how do they prepare and execute on those? So first off, the key word you use, Jeremy, is conversation. It's dialogue. It has to be, it is, you know, has to be with a voice, a personal voice on behalf of the enterprise voice. So number one, we want them to be authentic, right? They need to relax and be themselves. And at the same time, they need to press to have an actual conversation. And that conversation could be via phone in this current environment. It can be via Zoom or other technology, but it needs to be a dialogue. It cannot be a spreadsheet. It cannot be a number. It has to be a dialogue. So number one, we're counseling them to, to, for many of them, they've been having these conversations with their clients and employees, so it's natural. But we're telling them the more that you can create a sense of two-way dialogue, the better. Second, form and substance matter as well. How many times have you, Jeremy, or the CEOs and C-suite leaders you've interviewed said, you know, I misread, misinterpreted, or why did they IM me when they're one, 10 feet away from me? Or why did they send me an email when they're one office away from me? Well, now we're operating temporarily in a virtual remote environment. We're saying stick to having a conversation and understand that both the substance and the form of the message matters most. Yeah, because people will default to maybe what's easiest, not what's best. So they may right. text someone or email someone and then yes. there's no context there. Yeah, and to your point, these, these are big decisions, not little ones. And they're impacting, you know, both short and long term for individuals and those behind those individuals, their families and, and, and the like. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back a little bit, yeah. Nick, and I'm curious, how did you get <laughs> involved in this starting this community at uh, all yeah no it's fascinating if anybody looks at my background they're going to say okay he has a he has a background in finance but he was a lawyer and he was uh, in leadership roles in a variety of different professional services firms with the financial focus how did that how did this come about so i was asked so um in a former leadership role in the professional services space I was asked by the CEO of this firm, I need to understand what's driving your performance and passion. And you know what? I said, I don't really know the answer to that question. And rather than go away and lock myself in a room and try to psychoanalyze myself, I actually said, why don't I ask the people that are coming to me or responding to me why they're coming to me and responding to me. And that group that was most frequently coming to me or asking my opinion were chief financial officers given the work that I was doing and my firm was doing. So I took seven of them out to dinner. I invited them to dinner. Their only connection was that they were CFOs who were coming to me. And uh, I took them to a really nice place, Jeremy, with some really good food and some really good wine and I made sure we were pouring the wine, right, to break <laughs> down the barriers. 
And I treated them like a focus group. And I said, all right, I need to know, why are you coming to me with issues and opportunities that are personal to you and or really critical to your performance as a CFO and therefore critical to your enterprise performance? And here's what they said. Beyond being a qualified, somewhat selfless listener, so I was competent, right? It wasn't like I was, you know, they're asking them stupid questions. Um, they said m more often than not, I was connecting them to a qualified peer to challenge or validate the confidence in decision making. And to them, there was no greater source of qualified competency building and confidence building than to tap into a qualified network of their peers. And I said, okay, that's great. I'm viewed as that connector. And no one thought I was wasting their time. So I was efficient and effective. I said, if I created a place where you could tap into that more frequently with greater efficiency and effectiveness than having to pick up the phone and call me, would you spend time, energy, and effort to make that the place you went? And the answer was yes. Hmm. And that became the genesis for creating a network. And I never wanted it to be an association. Because no offense to the association world, you're you are um, historically. You are, your boundaries are geography, right? Your market. So Jeremy, you're in Chicago. I'm in Philadelphia. I wouldn't know what was going on in Chicago if my boundaries were chapters or local groups. I wanted the qualifier to be this network for finance leaders by function based upon shared interests in issues, industries, and markets. And I wanted it social so the dialogue and reputations were built based upon what you contributed, not what you took, what you contributed with your voice and your mind and your heart. So we began building it. So the CFO Alliance, and we'll get to the CHRO, but the CFO Alliance, so you know, there's a lot of aspects and dimensions to, to the CFO Alliance. What are some of the things when people um, explore it and engage with it, what do they get? How does it work? Um, so, so we do tell people that if you're looking for a catalyst or lightning rod for your own professional understanding and development, and by the way, we don't mandate that you apply everything you learn to, to what you do. It's not that rigor of a programmatic system, but we do tell them that your reputation is predicated based upon your participation and your uh, contributions to enhance people's understandings. So you're incentivized, totally. incentivized to share. And by the way, what's the knock on CFOs that I started with? They were viewed as not sharing. They were viewed as kind of locked away, less social by nature, less visible. We said, no, the only way into this network is by putting yourself in and making yourself vulnerable to admit what you don't know. Yeah. And maybe- It's a tough thing, yeah. It is. Maybe, maybe your reputation's built on telling someone else, don't make the mistakes I made, right? Versus, oh, we have all the answers, right? So I, I think that, first of all, we know whether or not it's right, and, and an individual knows whether or not our networks are right for them, because if they, they love that idea yeah. of putting themselves in there like that, they're gonna thrive. They resonate with it or they don't. I just had yeah. someone email me the other day, they said, Jeremy, you're a part of this network. What do you think? And I'm like, you know, you get whatever you put into it for one. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're willing to get out there and make the connection and also, you know, sh like you said, be vulnerable and share what's going on, not just the wins, but like yeah. some of the mistakes, that's going to be most valuable for people so they can avoid those things. How do you yeah. get people to share and be vulnerable? Well, I, I, I'll tell you, we use our ears. So I've never uh, and uh, never at all directed, managed, or led our team here at Achieve Next to build it and they will come. So we've created in a 24-7, 365 environment of surveying, benchmarking, and best practice sharing. And we simply use that data to draw them in. To say, listen, your peers are talking about X. Therefore, we think it's recommended that you join that discussion or you contribute your voice. And we've never done a panel or podium virtually or face-to-face. -face. So what we've done is say, 
create an environment online and offline for dialogue. So the, my, I'm, I'm pointing to my ears. My ears, our ears are our greatest source of determining what should be talked about and, and environment to be talking about it in. So, you know, there's the, where the connectivity and the dialogue-oriented nature of the network leads to the competency building and or focus for discussions and exchange. So CFO Alliance, Nick, when someone joins, what, what are some of the aspects? What do they get? Yeah, so, so we produce an ongoing series of one-to-one -one small group and large group discussions. And this current environment that, that's done with technology, you know, we'll bring together uh, 35 to 50 finance leaders based upon some combination of shared interest or desire to connect on an issue, an industry, or a market. And, and we will facilitate a focused discussion mm -hmm. for them, either prompting them with questions and or data, much like you do, Jeremy, with your podcasts. We do that in an environment and then we catalog everything and then we report back. Here's what we talked about. Here's what we learned. And here were some barriers or places we need to go deeper. And we take that into the next discussion and we go deeper. So the conversations are given a life and a scale. So you've got the intimacy, um, intimacy of talking with a group that you trust, but connectivity to a much broader network that are also brought into that discussion. So they get a, a network, they can, a peer-to-peer -peer network, they can get their questions answered or share, but they also get the insights of the group. Like, let's say you can't attend one of them. Yeah. You get the kind of the collective insights of the group and kind of what's going on. Yeah. And there you met and mentioned one of the beauties of the network is that time is the greatest asset we're managing. And we know that everyone has the best of intentions to participate in discussions and peer groups like this, but they may not have the ability to do so. We've given them a way to both contribute to and access the key takeaways and learnings and solutions and tools offered in an efficient and effective way. And I think that's what everybody's looking for. Uh, in this day and age? How do I tap into that most efficiently and effectively when time is my greatest asset? Yeah, so it's both of those. Anything else I'm missing as far as, you know, how it works? They get the peer-to-peer -peer network um, virtually and in person, also uh, benchmark and insights. Because I was reading on your site too, you have some assessments as well. Yeah, we do. I mean, I think that the CFOs have taught us a lot. My peers in the finance community have said, if we can't measure it, we're not going to talk about it. Or we're going to, we're going to push that to someone to, to, to drive so deep until it can be measured in some way. So we believe in assess, analyze, understand, communicate, and, 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 and continue to follow that. Now, um, in some cases, those assessments already exist. And in other cases, we have to create them. You know, mm -hmm. we were the architects behind creating a culture IQ, a way for C-suite leaders to measure the strength of their culture as it relates to the strength of their business. And so, because something like that didn't exist. So part of it is we'll take off the shelf um, uh, and, and tested by time and science driven assessments and we'll make those available. And in other cases, those are created based upon need and demand for something that does not yet exist. Yeah, because I saw an RQ assessment. Yeah, well, I mean, talk about timely in this day and age, the strength of relationships matter most. That's an, that RQ is predicated upon helping individuals identify and measure the strength of the relationships that are most critical to their individual or enterprise performance. Hmm. How great is that, right? An actual tool and a way that if you're going to invest time, energy, and effort to increase the strength, don't you want to measure the impact? That RQ is created hmm. with that in mind. You know, I'm interested, you know, what I liked about the Bloomberg interview, one of the things actually, is um, they're asking some real specific, some real specific questions and um, you got into some of the details and you're like, you kind of just have to experience it and be a fly in the wall at one of these <laughs> groups. I'm curious about, you know, you don't have to go into the full details, but you can. Um, mm -hmm. What's like, what would be a controversial discussion 
among CFOs? Like what, what's yeah, I, I, among I each an, other? I, I can give you an example of one. So you mentioned that we created a second, a second Alliance Peer Advisory Network for Chief Human Resource Officers because, by the way, 90% of the discussions that we were having around business strategy, enterprise performance, capital structure, risk management, um, and technology, we ended up talking about, guess what, Jeremy? People, right? And so the CFO said, from a foundational standpoint, we need to strengthen our uh, uh, horse, our, our own enterprise positioning and our own relationships with the greatest assets that we have with our people. So that has to involve an HR leader. So we bring together a group of finance and HR leaders about 18 months ago, and we said, you're going to create the second network. Okay. And you're going to create the focus foundation and alignment to strengthen that relationship between finance leaders and HR leaders. And they said, you know what? We want to be the ones who work with the other C-suite leaders, including the CEO, to strengthen the alignment between our employee experience and our customer experience, our CX and EX. And we want to be able to measure that strength. How cool would that be for finance and HR to own that API? I'll tell you tough discussion piece, guess who they decide, so it's tough, by the way, to bring finance and HR leaders to have that discussion, right? Because let's typecast. Finance views HR as too soft and touchy-feely, and HR says, finance, you got your head in the numbers, you got to understand the impact to the people. So we bring them together and they break down that wall, and one of the ways we broke that down is both said one of the greatest sources of their pain are the people who drive top-line revenue. And the inconsistencies and inability to predict their performance and behavior with some level of uncertainty. So they found a common point of interest that they wanted to focus on, which was whoever's involved with sales, we need to, we need to look at because they're a great source of our stress and pain, but we're not in business without them. It's Why is that? Hard. What was stressful about it? Um, neither one liked uh, uncertainty liked lack of predictability, liked being told, well, it's hard for me to explain, but trust me, the sale is there. Or I've had that relationships for a decade. I know the world's changed, but my relationship hasn't. So just trust me. Or I'm an A player. I commit to you and 18 months later, I'm leaving. You know, they viewed a lot of the behaviors in sales as being difficult to predict, manage, and understand. And I'm not, by the way, criticizing the sales component. I'm just mentioning that Reporting, lack of predictability, yeah. right? And so the tough discussion was, well, we all agree. They are the mighty, mighty through our business. They drive, drive our top line performance, but we both struggle individually and collectively with creating consistency in our relationship. It feels really good when we quote, hit the numbers or we exceed the numbers. But what about if we don't hit the numbers, the relationship feels like it's on shaky ground. Why is that? We don't have that same relationship with other people inside the enterprise or in other functions. So there a tough discussion has to be had around, you know, how does finance and HR really play in that CX experience where the sales team says, we got this, right? So were there anything, <laughs> any, um, commonalities what did what were some of the things they came up with so i think they both agreed that that um that there's a quantifiable and qualifiable component to a customer relationship that some of it is in the numbers and some of it is not and we need to be okay with that but we need a mechanism to have consistent understanding and dialogue and sense of we in the equation because the cfo would say especially in a situation where an enterprise or a performer was flat or trending downward, that the discussions were a lot harder to have. And, and I go back to, why is that? You, you have no problem having the discussion when things were good. Why is that more difficult for you? And they said, well, you're right, because we really don't have a process or mechanism where we're involved when things are going well and trying to aid them in that effort to accelerate that. We were mm -hmm. still being viewed as monitoring the numbers, not being mired and involved in the numbers uh, in some way. Because they and were only brought in, in in the negative situations. Yeah, yeah. 
So we so said, how do they get brought in in the positive situation? That's the, the key piece. We said what was once not measurable now is, right? In both sales and marketing, strength of relationship can be measured with a score. So if you see a score, uh, you know, bring a financial component to that and say, let's talk about that score. Let's talk about how I can help you move that score up right? Become an advocate for a partner to the effort in both the good and the bad, right? So, so I, think on the, uh, I think on the one hand, they said, wait a minute, um, it's not just a, an income statement driven discussion. Our CRM technology, our marketing technology now gives us the ability to help them better understand their relationships and their pipeline, but they may not have the same level of comfort or competency with those numbers. I mean, how many times, Jeremy, have you had a conversation where a finance person says, let me show that to you, and they give you a spreadsheet, and you're like, I don't understand that, right? Yeah. Bring it to them in a way that's digestible for them, substance and form for those numbers. And I think that's the big aha for finance and HR. Learn to communicate the way that people naturally may prefer to or more, most comfortably communicate in both substance and form. Mm. You, you have CFOs who are um, in charge of private companies and public companies. And not um, profits. Yeah. Um, talk to like the entrepreneur, CEO, growing his company. At what point should they bring in a CFO? Well, I will tell you, there should be a financial focus and a foundation for CFO-like um, input in, uh, in day one right? In the earliest stages, you may not have to bring that in, in the substance and form of a partner or FPE with a finance um, uh, price tag and the like. There's so many different options there in this day and age, right? But I think you need to bring that, that finance competency day one. Like Um, just hire someone as maybe on a consulting basis to put some systems in place type of thing. I will tell you that world of CFO consulting, when I first started this journey around the CFO Alliance, used to be a great career path for finance leaders who were evergreening in their careers. The latest stages, I still want to stay connected, but I don't need the rigor and the stress of a full-time position or a stakeholder interest. I will tell you that has completely changed. There is a world of opportunity and a diverse population of qualified finance leaders more than willing to work with entrepreneurs and leaders in some capacity. That's the unique piece. You have some willing to do it for free. You have some willing to do it with very little upfront cost and an opportunity to participate. You have some willing to do it on a retainer. You have some willing to do it by the hour. You have some that have 10 years experience and some that have 40, right? I think it's such a different world we live in now. Gig economy used to mean something completely different than it does today. So I think the DNA piece you can tap into is no longer limited to, uh uh-oh, I'm hiring a consultant or uh uh-oh, I've got to hire an FTE. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious of your roadmap, like let's say in the beginning, and I know every company is different, but let's say in the beginning, okay, you should definitely hire some CFO on a consulting basis or have them participate in some way. And then the next step would be at what point do you decide to maybe bring in a fractional CFO or actually bring someone in full time? Is there a, you know, an employee count or a, a number of revenue or something like that as a general rule? Or uh, can I give can I give some advice to us to other CEOs who are yeah. entrepreneurial who have gone from idea back of napkin to to some level of business performance? The second that you feel lonely in that CEO seat is the second that you need to bring a CFO into your lens for discussion. Because that sense of loneliness in some way, shape, or form is about a decision you need to make or would have made or should have made or should make. And there's no greater source for me as the CEO than to bounce that off of a qualified finance leader. Because he or she will ask the tough questions that are, that are most critical to shareholder value, top line and bottom line performance, which is what you have in mind in business. Yeah. So I think the second that you feel that and you, where you do that physical look around like, uh-oh, I need to ask a question, is when you need to talk to someone who's been in that seat as a CFO. Yeah. And, and what I like about when I talk to, to CFOs, 
or fractional CFOs is they, their decisions are led by data. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times I feel like decisions are made out of gut and maybe not data. Exactly. Or Back maybe to my word basis, Jeremy. Remember we started this discussion. I yeah. said basis is a qual quantifiable term. Yeah. And uh, honestly, when it, you're probed by a finance leader, they're usually trying to, with sometimes inadvertently, understand the basis you're using to make that decision. Right, right. To your right. point. Yeah, and when I say people, I mean myself. No, I'm <laughs> um, um, so can people go to your network or do they to say, who do you recommend? Here's my situation. Yeah. How, how do other leaders and CEOs, entrepreneurs use your I'm, network I, outside? Um, one of the one, uh, oh, so we have a passion for connectivity. We've, you know, our tagline is trademark making connections that count. And the count, by the way, was a play on words for our finance leaders. Count means both matter, and we were also saying count, as in numbers themselves. But I will tell you, we, we have a mantra in our networks. We're not an either-or equation. We're a both-and equation. We want to be a go-to source for you and a go-to source for others. Yes, we're going to protect privacy and confidentiality so things can happen behind the walls so that you can talk freely. But we want to be an aggregator and invite as many people in. So our networks are meant for people to come in, try and or pose a question, or at least say, can I pose a question? How do I do that most effectively? Um, and, so outside and people can do that? Outside people can do that through, through our team, yes, and through our platform. Hmm. Very yeah. cool. Now, once again, we will make sure that it adheres to a code of conduct and a sense of privacy and purpose. Because we don't also, we want purpose for you. You may have a question, Jeremy, and I may say, here's the best way. Let me talk to our team. You, how best to get that question answered where it's going to be stickiest and most resonant with someone looking and or seeing or wanting to respond. Hmm. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, I love it. There's definitely, what pops up to me is like, I feel like every company when it's starting needs like a CFO roadmap or some kind of roadmap yeah. of, of, you know, when you engage and at what point uh, and what level, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, well, and so much of what our CFOs are willing to do for each other are gratis and off the clock. I mean, I will tell you, that's what makes this network fun is the questions that are posed. You can imagine right now, given the crisis and, and, and that we all work through in terms of, you know, the, the 2020 issues, we'll call them. Um, now more than ever, people need the ability to, to, to say, am I crazy? Or I'm not alone in this, right? And or... Tell me what you think. Tell me what you've done. What do you recommend I do? Or here's what I think I'm going to do before I do it. What do you think? Yeah. People need a sounding board and some validation yeah. around it. Yeah. Um, Nick, first of all, thank you. Um, I, I have two last questions I ask with Inspired Insider, but I just want to thank you for taking the time. Thank I you. know you have tens of thousands of people that you're connected with and, and communicating with, especially in this crazy time. So I totally yeah. appreciate it. And People should check out AchieveNext.com and AchieveNextNetworks.com to see what you have going on and check out the other content you have out there for sure. Um, right. I always ask since, since Inspired Insider, what has been um, a low moment or challenging time and how you push through? And then on the flip side, what's been a proud moment? and something that you're especially proud of, a milestone or something like that? Well, I, I will tell you, low moment um, has been, uh, well, I will tell you, when you, I want to give a piece of advice to everyone because this ties to my low moment. Um, I believe we're living in an age of life and career lattices, not ladders. Picture a lattice, which is a series of ways to pivot and move across, down, and around. And, and not a straight line up. And, and for my generation, uh, Gen X, we were groomed and taught climb the ladder. And so I've had a lot of frustrating moments where I've had to explain my redefinition mm -hmm. and my journey and my desires that drive my passion for my career and the intersection between my personal and professional lives. There's a consistency there. And so the low points have been frustrating. Uh, why do I have to explain why I'm not a lawyer practicing law? I have a lot of respect for the profession, but after a while, having to start there and explain becomes 
extremely frustrating and stressful uh, to you, to my passion and my energy level. And so uh, I, I, my greatest source of kind of frustration has been seeing the, the, how slow it's taken for us to start to embrace career and life lattice movement, not ladder movement. And I, I, I suggest to everyone and everyone, don't get typecast. Don't feel that there's only one path and that path is upward. Sometimes a path down and around is gonna lead you to the greatest source of personal enjoyment and financial success. Yeah, I think you have a book titled Climb the Lattice, Not the Ladder or something like yeah, that. Yeah, how did you know? We're yeah. working on that, yeah. Are you really? Okay. Yeah, we are. I am working on a book that, that really takes that concepts and try to make it real for individuals give them some sense of purpose and pathway towards that. And uh, look, I hope I've provided that to the people I interact with. I try to lead by example, but I'm constantly learning too. That's just why I'm thrilled to get connected to you and your networks and your podcast. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because people, you know, they, people have an identity with sometimes a profession. And so there's like a deep seated, almost you're going against your identity. If you, if you are a lawyer and you define yourself as a lawyer and you do something else, you've almost gone against your identity. Yeah, Jeremy, in 2002, I wrote an article called Running from the Law, which was a personal, <laughs> no, it was a yeah. personal story that of my story of having to explain to my family and friends why I was pivoting. And it got published by a, a legal publication that did not make reference to my age. And I remember receiving phone calls from individuals in the profession who said, more power to you. Um, I give you uh, my sense of respect that you are, are steering and driving and embracing your passion. And for you, maybe the practice of law was not your passion, but I give you more credit for saying, go for what is. Yeah. And, um, but it wasn't easy because, you know, yeah, I think my, God bless, my father's still alive and a major influencer for me, but I think he still refers to me as a lawyer uh, and, and when asked, what does your son do? You know, my business partner, John Corcoran, calls himself a recovering attorney. And um, obviously we, you know, help businesses run and launch their podcast, but yeah. He says, I'm a recovering attorney. So that's yeah. what he says. So he totally relate to that. I, I, I won't use that overtly because it infers that it's like um, a, a disease. Most, a disease. <laughs> like, I have so much respect for the profession yeah. and for my people in it. Just wasn't my passion. Yeah. Right. I think, yeah, he says it tongue in cheek. But yeah, totally. Um, what about on the flip side? A proud moment, a milestone? Like, um, I, I am in you, my passion. You're in yeah, where you need to be, you know? It was, it was recently, Jeremy. Um, so we uh, had the opportunity to uh, have pro some prominent business leaders asked to meet with our leadership team here at Achieve Next, who were very curious as to what we were up to. And usually, no, I shouldn't say usually, up until that day, the storytelling behind Achieve Next was done by me. And in this case, my team offered to tell the story to these leaders and they did a phenomenal job. I think I was smiling ear to ear because it was the first time that I had the opportunity to say this wasn't my vision, it was our vision. And they not only influenced that vision, they now could articulate it better than I could. Mm -hmm. And with the same authentic, their own sense of passion and purpose. That's probably my proudest moment because it's hard to explain what we do. You run these networks and you have these solutions and we don't make a widget, you know? And so it, I've always had to explain it. And now to have a team explain it in the way they did better than I would, I was like, I, that's my moment. If I don't have another moment again, <laughs> that's my moment. Yeah. Pass, passing on that vision and that direction and having other people see it and, and be able to communicate it. Um, First of all, Nick, thank you. Um, everyone should check out Achieve Next and AchieveNextNetworks.com. Any other places we should point people towards online or, or to you? No, I mean, I really hope that during uh, 2020 and, our, and, and what we're facing, that, that each of your listeners has taken a moment to reflect on, on, is there someone that I had connected with in my past that I have not connected with that I should? 
Mm. And I, I suggest you go do that and make a rigor around that because that's really what was the genesis of all of this was and our discussion was. People said, you, I went out of my way to bring like-minded people together who would challenge or va- not even like-minded, like functioned, who may approach things differently. And, and, and there was great value in that. We can all do that. And I hope that, you know, that's a great kind of action item that can come out from this beyond going to us, looking for us to help them do that, which we're always happy to do. Thank you so much. Check out what they have, whether you're a CEO, CFO, CHRO, or anyone in the C-suite, or you're just running your business, check it out. Nick, thanks so much. Thank you, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.